And there's a grave danger in thinking of a collapsed society operating just the way it does today. In other words, in a collapsed society, air-conditioned motels might not uh, operate unless you had had the wit earlier to switch away from grid power systems to independent power production. Uh, my own preference would be through photovoltaic cells. But these are things that I think, uh, Kurt, you, you, I'm sure you think of yourself. Well, our electricity comes from Bull Shoals. It's completely independent from the rest of the state. Yes, with Bull Shoals, uh, I could wreck Bill, Bull Shoals in five minutes. No, me too. But I might want to. You see, you're talking about a collapsed society. Well, I don't believe, as a matter of fact, it's going to collapse. Uh, but what I think is going to happen to it is it's going to change drastically. And the change is now already visible. It seems to me evolution is at work. And you now have a, around the world, I do believe, a movement of the incompetence uh, into positions of power. All powerful institutions today are manned by uh, not terribly bright people, <laughs> which reminds me of another saying that I thought of. <laughs> You know the one about cream rising to the top? That's not true. Crud rises to the top. <laughs> and the personality of people who want to be political leaders is essentially cruddy. And nobody else gets there, and nobody else ever will get there. It's uh, uh, worthwhile noting that great leaders usually do not turn out to be terribly intelligent people. So I think what is happening, evolution happily at work, the dummies are gravitating toward the institutions, and smart people are gravitating toward their homes, their localities, and their skills. And this, I think, will go on for a long, long time. Nobody is capable by revolutionary action of overturning great social systems. It has never been done. There hasn't been a revolution uh, by armed force ever in the history of the world. What we have had is changes of management, very often, but no revolutions. The revolutions take place in laboratories. They take place in laboratories, and they take place in, uh, on tilled fields and such places. Such a revolution is taking place. The entire technology of the 20th century has moved toward decentralization and miniaturization. All of the tools now move in this direction. And with genetic engineering, final tools begin moving in this direction. We now begin to operate at a molecular level uh, in technology. And this is revolutionary. Most major managers do not manage technology well because they are essentially managers, not creators. Uh, with, the mini with the microcomputer today, in most big companies, there's a concerted effort by the managers of the data processing departments to keep mini microcomputers out of the hands of individual department managers. Because as many of them say, if they have them, how can we control? And as you know, the main major function of modern management has never had anything to do with productivity. It has had to do with reward and punishment and the maintenance of power. Modern managers are inept all modern major corporations are poor users of technology. To use a technology, well, most. The most significant thing about Bell Laboratories, which is, I'm sure, everybody's favorite, is there was the part of the Bell system least like the rest of it. And of course, as it became bureaucratized, it became less cre creative. So it occurs to me we now refer to another old wisdom, not too old, uh, but there was a philosopher who said, workers of the world unite. Incorrect. Poor grasp of the, ready, uh, of the technology. The thing should be workers of the world disperse, and as soon as possible. Which leads us to the presentation this morning, which I admire your work very much, but I would never want to be part of any project that would speak truth to power, to use the old phrase. It's not worth it. The goal, it occurs to me, is never to speak truth to power, which has proven historically now to be a poor user of truth, however you define truth, information. 
The thing to do is to destroy power. Power itself, hierarchical power particularly, runs counter to every tool that is now available. In short, to think of any structure in hierarchical terms is to throw out all of the available tools. Because all of the available tools suggest in productive systems, in social systems, by which I mean agreements between individual human beings, all suggest that people can be individually responsible today for all of their actions. Not just their actions in terms of their relationships with other people, they can now be responsible individually for productive practices. In short, villages can produce automobiles. Households can produce interferon uh, after a time. The, all, of the mini, all of the microprocessor uh, technology suggests that small units can handle information. You can have the Library of Congress in a TP. You can do high energy physics now without a particle accelerator if you're very smart about it. Nothing, I, I'm really, the charge that the technology has caused problems I think is just the worst of all charges. It never caused any problems. Science and technology have been tools used poorly and well by individual human beings. There is no dynamic about it. It never had to go any particular way. All decisions are made by people. They are not made by invisible forces. This is a prejudice of mine, and, and you need not listen to it for very long. But it occurs to me that I base my life on that, that assumption, that I can make decisions and carry through with them, and that now I have the tools available in my village and in my home to make all of these decisions, to not be dependent on any outside authority whatsoever, so that now I can make agreements with neighbors based on real parity. I don't have to make agreements with doctors because they know more than me. There is a diagnostic program that Jan Prince, whom many of you know, is working on now for emergency room use that should enable anyone uh, with their, their wits about them to handle most uh, uh, medical emergencies. Already, no, about 80% of anything that happens to you can be handled simply by doing nothing uh, because these are all self-repairing activities. Information is the key to just about everything there is. I should mention, I think that if you think about this for a time, you might uh, be able to conclude that all management all administration can be replaced by information. Short, if there is information available, the administrator is not needed. Administrators in the past have simply been nodes where information has collected, and they have tended to restrict it rather than distribute it. Now, the idiot world, the world of the great institutions, General Motors, the federal government, the Soviet Union, and other obnoxious entities of a collectivist nature, uh, are as inept as anybody. They are the most inept people on the face of the earth. Only Ronald Reagan thinks the Russians are competent, so far as I know. I don't have any neighbors who think they're competent. Hyman Rickover doesn't think they're competent. No, I don't suppose the Russians think they're terribly competent. I don't think that Andropov gets up in the morning and glories in the productive system of the Soviet Union, for God's sake. Uh, I mean, it's a lousy system. And only ideologues fear it, it occurs to me. Uh, which brings us to a point, ideology. I, don't cur I agree with Kerr on so many things, uh, so I would talk about everything I agree with you on. I don't think you mentioned, though, some of the great diseases that afflict people and uh, affect their potential survival. Of all these diseases, ideology is probably, it seems to me, the most dreadful. A person afflicted by ideology is unlikely to make decisions based on reality. They make decisions based on fantasies. They, have, they say a thing, say a thing, this is moral and that is immoral, and then they live their, basis, their life on the basis of what they once said, regardless of confronting information or anything else. They just, now, I do not want too many neighbors around me who are ideologues. I think personality is much more important than ideology. 
a person may, like Kurt, have the most obnoxious opinions of many things and yet have a wonderful personality. I think Kurt would be a good neighbor. Uh, and I would say of uh, some of his more idiosyncratic views of the world, hmm, so what? You know, I shoot as well as he does. I'm a student of Aikido, and I'm twice as uh, violent. I have a terribly violent nature. So I wouldn't worry about any of his opinions. Opinions are bullshit. They tell you nothing about a person. You have to be, you have to be with a person and know them. And that's one of the things that I hope that in this diverse Congre, that people would, would slow down on this, this reflexive feeling about opinions. I mean, who cares? I mean, I can advocate cannibalism uh, because I'm a meat eater and I don't see that there's a hell of a lot of difference uh, between what kind of meat you eat. So what? If I don't intend to eat you, it, oc it occurs to me that this is a ho-hum proposition, uh, this cannibalism business. What you want to know is, do I eat people? Not do I say cannibalism is good, so you must come and live with me. <laughs> <laughs> then we find out about these things. Now there's another old slogan <laughs> that I thought of too, and that is that those who live by the sword, you know the rest of it, I think it should be revised to say that those who live by the sword have recklessly restricted their armaments. <laughs> <laughs> because they're the notion that there is a solution, even in armaments, it strikes me as a limited, a very limited notion. There's a greater solution in wits and in the condition of yourself. The greatest weapon you have is you. No artificial weapon will ever be quite as impressive as that. And if you have not taken great pains about that weapon, the weapon of your wits and the weapon of your body, the weapon of your skills, and I do not think you can buy your way into a situation where Abercrombie and Fitch or Holland and Holland can provide you <laughs> with substitutes. You, if you have not attended to those tools, you then belong over on the other side with the dummies. Uh, I'm working on a book now called A Plague of Dumb. And it, is, it strikes me as a, a much better explanation for what is going on than the evil theory. I don't know about evil. I don't know about morality. I'm immoral. I'm probably evil. And I have absolutely no ideology. And all of these terrible things. But I do know this, I think, that I observe that there are now, we may be speciating. This is a, an odd thing to digress into, but it does happen. <laughs> Simply because a person walks around and looks like a familiar creature, it is not safe to assume that they're human. Because <laughs> evolution does work. And so there may be some people who have all of this, this appearance of being a human who are not. Now, I think you, you, you know most of them work for the federal government. <laughs> Either work for it or lead it. That's another aphorism, I think. Neither a leader nor a follower be. But nevertheless, all of these people who are over there has display as one characteristic a refusal to think. Uh, that they do not do. They will never think particularly about the consequences of their actions. So you know who they are and you know who you are. Now they're not evil. They're not even immoral. They're just that kind of creature who does not think. Now it occurs to me that rather than thinking about abusing them, although it would be pleasurable to do so, the thing to do is to think about how to avoid them. Uh, to be somewhere else at all times. Now, is Harrison's a fine place to be? Rogue River? Any place. Go anywhere. But I would say as a prescription, do not under any circumstance, at any time in your life, support authority. Support authority. This does not mean that you should go around recklessly exposing yourself to, to uh, penalties for flaunting it, but simply never support it. In all instances of a situation in which the greater good or any other glowing promise is put before you and in which you are asked to serve, simply say no. 
No is the most terrifying word in the language to authority. No. I do not think authority fears attack, subversion, or anything as much as the simple statement, no. No, I will not. Non serviam. I will not serve. Everybody is capable of saying that. You do not have to be part of a movement. You don't have to have an ideology. You don't have to be in a party or anything. You can say no. And you can continue to say no. And you can continue to move away from it. Everything finally comes down to that, it seems to me. All of the grand talking about collapsing systems, about changing systems, comes down to what will you do? Not what will you do to the world, but what will you do individually? There is no limit to the range of action that individuals have. Everything that you complain about is solvable for yourself now and immediately. If you really think things are going to hell and you're miserable, it is nobody's fault, I believe, but your own. You are absolutely responsible for what you do. You create the entire world in your head anyway, and you can solve its problems using your head in the same way. You must do something. You must not constantly argue with your friends about the best thing to do, I do not believe. You must not denounce your friends uh, because they take one course and you take another. It occurs to me that instead of all of these, this, this intellectual jolly uh, business of, of carping that goes on so constantly, there would be much better if people simply did those things which changed the world for them immediately and now. They are all, every one of us is capable of doing that. Having done that, we then have a lot of time in which to engage in the production of new and interesting uh, devices, uh, social arrangements, and so forth. But you first must make the decision that you will change your world, and you can. Well, let's see, what else has come up lately? Uh, nuclear war. I don't, well, I've got, I now have a credential that makes me almost immune to concern about these things. In the mail, about two weeks ago, I got my official senior citizen card from the asshole governor of our state. <laughs> and, <coughs> and it occurs to me, what a wonderful reminder this is. You know, I'm living on borrowed time already. <laughs> and I understand that if you're 16 years old, it might seem terrible. but. That brings up death, doesn't it? Let me refer to that, because we had a little discussion about that uh, today. The fear of death occurs to me <laughs> as being a foolish fear. Uh, since uh, it's likely to happen to everyone, it, rather than fearing it, it occurs to me that first you must come to terms with it. And in no way is this more important than in, in opposing great authority. Because great authority has as its base the ability to kill you. Authority has, so far as I know, and particularly in the political sense, no other base. It has the single base that it can kill you. It has no base in, uh, in reason. There's no particular reason for obeying laws. It can kill you. Now, if that panics you, then, of course, you say to authority, Christ, anything but that. Do not kill me, I will serve. I will do anything. Once you come to terms, I, I feel very strong, once you come to terms with the fact that this is inevitable, you're going to die uh, at any rate, it's a matter of scheduling, and that as a matter of fact, that's not as important as what you're doing right now, then finally the state has nothing left to do to you. There is no other thing they can do because you can say no ultimately. No. Simply no. Then they kill you. Well, that's changed the schedule and nothing else about your life. I think it's comforting. It's always also comforting to know, it seems to me, that you can turn it off anytime you want. You see, so pain, agony, misery, all of these things become simpler and less frightening 
once this fear is gone, in the first of the Dune books, I think one of the uh, one of the priestesses says, "Fear is the mind killer," and I'm I'm rather convinced that that is true. Fearful people uh, do not fight well. Uh, it is wise to understand the power of an opponent, but to fear it is to tremble before it, and to tremble is to not be centered, and to not be centered is to not be strong. And uh, you become a victim, it seems to me. So at any rate, that's so much for death, and so much for nuclear war. I mean, yes, I suppose it's absolutely possible. I think it's very unlikely because of the dumb factor. Do always take comfort in stupidity. Because in most of the missile tests recently, they don't launch. Now, if ours don't launch, what in the hell are the Russians doing? I mean, those people are in case. A mining engineer in the Soviet Union is somebody who can put in waterproof wires. Uh, I mean, those people are, they have no, nothing to recommend them whatsoever. And if, if, ours, if our army is stoned, Christ, think of what their army is. There's six guys commit suicide by drinking tank brake fluid the other day, I was told, because they were just bored to death. They should be bored to death. They live in a boring place. <laughs> well, at any rate, fear. Fear is a problem, it turns to me. I don't know. I really don't know anything, as a matter of fact. I've discovered this lately after I got my card, because it, it, it said that I was now wise. And, and I guess that's the wisest thing. I'll, ref I'll finish off finally by reference back to the great f statements of the founding of our order. Uh, the first one, which uh, no one argues with, the sum of the, the whole of the law is do what thou wilt. Now, the fact of the matter is you do it anyway. You bow to authority, that's what you do. You do that. No, not somebody else. They don't bring in a puppet to do it. You do it. You debase yourself uh, before authority. All people do what they will. You have an infinite number of choices. On the second one, I think I heard some gasps when it was pronounced. There is no truth. That's the first part of it. That's simply a statement of the scientific method, which is one of the more interesting things that has come up in the world uh, over the past few centuries. And the second one is everything is permissible. Anything is permissible. But of course, that's the fact. You know that to be the fact. Somebody can go berserk in here this afternoon and engage in a first class slaughter. It's all permissible. People can do anything. The remarkable thing is that they don't. That we have the capacity both to do anything or to restrain ourselves from doing it. And I think that the summation of all of this is simply the notion of individual responsibility. We all practice it. The question is whether we practice it thoughtfully or simply reflexive, reflexively. And I think the world is now divided. There's a great schism. There are the people who think about their lives, and there are the, there are the people who do not. I once was concerned that it was part of my job in the world to save it. I now am not even convinced there is a world because I have little empirical proof of it, as a matter of fact. But I know one thing, it is not my responsibility in any sense to save it, nor is it my responsibility to identify with every human being in it, and so on. I've, there's so much to be done in Berkeley County, West Virginia, and so much to be done on our homestead, and so much to be done in the things I want to think about, and there's so many dogs to be petted and so much love to be made. And all of these terribly important things that I think it's, it, it must, it has to be a very low priority to become agitated by opinion. Uh, I'm back to that. And I'll, cont I'll go back to it just once more. There's going to be more opinion around this place over the next few days than has probably been, it may reach critical mass and we will all implode in, into this sort of thing. But the th try to be patient, even with me. Try to be patient. They, these are just people like me saying things that pop into their mind. It's like quantum mechanics. It's made up. 
It is not the real world. It is something we make up about the real world. And so are all of these opinions. Nobody should be able in this room to say anything that would offend anybody. Now, if they go hit you in the face, depending on the martial art you have studied, you will, of course, either do this or do that. But as for their opinion, sticks and stones, that's another old one that's so wise. Sticks and stones, as a matter of fact, can break your bones. Words cannot hurt you. The words have to attach themselves to a stick to hurt you. The vilest person in the world can proclaim a dictatorship, but they must have sticks and stones to make it hurt. I'll end with a comment on rights, because that will come up constantly, too. I am a barbarian. I'm a barbarian in nature, uh, by religious conviction, or no conviction, by every, every measure. And to criticize the Dark Ages, as a matter of fact, sort of uh, following my own rule, I don't take umbrage at it, but I wouldn't mind it of living through them at all, because it was a great barbarian age and produced a good deal of technology. But, but my feeling about rights is this. They don't exist. There are no rights. You cannot proclaim a right and have an effect from the pro proclamation. You can stand in the middle of a field and say everyone has a right to be fed, one of the sillier ones, but nonetheless a popular one, and nothing will happen. There are no rights. All rights are agreements, and agreements where? Between human beings, us. It's what we make up as ways we will conduct ourselves in relationship to each other, in relationship to the world. That's what they are. It is not, it seems to me, possible to find in the material world, in the natural world, or even inside your head, a set of absolute rules that had existed prior to human uh, activity. If these are found, I would be probably the first to accede to them. They do not exist. All of these things are the result of human thinking first and then of human action. And so it occurs to me that it's a very shaky rope to hang on to, to proclaim rights. A much sturdier notion, it seems to me, is to make agreements. If you believe in a certain set of rights, it occurs to me your wisest course is to live with and make agreements with people uh, who will observe and put those rights into practice. And then you have something very sturdy. But I don't think you should go up to a, a member of the Gestapo and say something like, you can't come in here, I have my rights. Uh, that's an unconvincing argument to an IRS agent, as I have discovered. You must be prepared, again, to do whatever you want to do uh, to them. It's your responsibility. It's not the responsibility of a political party to save you from it. It's your responsibility. You must deal with this other human being doing the swinish thing. And I don't think you can, you can have reference to anything but that immediate relationship. Oh my, well, hi-ho, I don't know, that's all I wanted to say. If anybody's got any questions, I wish I'd ask them. Barbara? There's, there certainly are a lot of sticks and stones. First, I believe it is wise to, to recognize that they're wielded by morons, generally, and by cowards. And that your first line of defense is to be courageous. Uh, certainly, to, to cower before authority is the worst possible uh, tactic, it seems to me. So first, uh, to be courageous, to be prepared. Be prepared to suffer if necessary. Uh, to be indomitable. Why not be indomitable? It's better than being domitable. Uh, so I think, again, all of the, all of the preparations takes place first in, in, in your mind and then in your body. I would certainly, uh, I don't know, it almost seems a detail, and yet I'm, I'm more and more impressed by it. I just think that I wasted so much of my life not understanding the use of my body. And 
and now that I'm a student of Aikido and a very clumsy one, I feel it even more sharply. So I recommend, among other things, that you might give about as a much attention uh, to this thing that you cart around with you as you do to uh, your opinions. I mean, I, I find there's a, a some, something of a discontinuity there between people who will spend thousands of dollars on a library of other people's opinions and then grow to have a lack of musculature, to be not graceful, uh, and so on. I, it just seems to me that that's, that's a wrong priority there. Yes, sir? Saying what you have just said awakens a very interesting question, uh, which I, I'll save, I think, for later. <laughs> I want to ask you another one. <laughs> no, you said one thing, Carl, and I've, I think I've heard you say it before. If not you, I've heard it from others. And that you don't want to speak truth to power. That baffles me a little bit, but I suspect that my bafflement arises out of not quite having you define your terms so that I know precisely what you are saying. It uh, has generally come to mean the, uh, the passionate uh, belief that if you could just get the ear of the monarch, you could set him or her right. Yeah, and, but that, yeah, I think it is nonsense, but it's, it's a, a powerful attraction for a number of people. And so that there are many, uh, many hours spent on trying to figure out how to, to do this. <laughs> the phrase as you used it seemed a, almost an invitation to speak something other than truth. To power, I think, is probably. Well, but I don't think that's what you meant. You are not saying, uh, tell me so if it, if it is. I would, lie, I would lie to the Gestapo. Uh, always? <coughs> If convenient. Oh, for a purpose. I don't think there's a principle involved. I think that they, they are on the other side, that's all. Um, that opens principle. the second question that I had first. Mm -hmm. uh, you uh, made a number of statements to the effect that you didn't believe in morality. I had none. That's what you said. Correct. And uh, I'm glad I'm quoting you correctly, and uh, et cetera. And of course, you stated that uh, anything is permissible, uh, by means of which you went on to explain that you meant by that that uh, human beings can do anything, that it is a practical fact. Uh, of course, I agree. But again, in the usage of the term, by saying that anything is permissible, it appeared that you were engaged in sanctioning anything that they might want to do. But then you went on to give us a very fine set of moral injunctions about the things we ought to do and ought not to do. What were uh, those? Well, uh, in fact, your, your latest one uh, actually related to correcting the values of a person who doesn't take care of his body, mm -hmm. because in your judgment, that's stupid. He should have taken care of his body. But that's all it body. is. It's just inconvenient. Uh, but you get my point. Yeah, I, I think I do, but I, I, re I resist it only because... Uh, but do you know what my point is? I believe I do. Uh, you, you believe that there are I things in which... I anything that I believe. Yeah, well, I don't either. Well, my point is this... No, my point is this, Carl. I think that you could help, certainly me, mm -hmm. and other dummies like me. But you're not. Well, no, but uh, others who are not like me. Uh, of <laughs> if you would define your terms a little more clearly. Yeah. You, you see, when I, I know you very well, and I, I adore you, as a matter of fact, but I don't want anybody to know that in uh, Arkansas. <laughs> uh, well, uh, uh, but, uh, I guess I would, I would have to say back to you that I'd prefer that you define the terms and I'll just stop using them. <laughs> yeah, be, I don't think there's anything, that I, and I've heard you lecture on several occasions, that you have ever said that I really disagreed with once I knew what you meant. But often... Maybe I'm not saying anything. 
No, you are. You are saying very, very profound things, very wise things, and I, I, I love them. They're great, but you sometimes put them in a context mm -hmm. where I think this man is now saying the opposite of what he said before. But then it comes up. Well, that's you good. Really aren't. That's good exercise. Oh, of course it is. I, I, I'm not trying to debate with. I, I just, uh, I just uh, wonder if you'd like to think about this. Oh, Bob, I know. You know I, I very well. Mm, I'll do it for you. Okay. Yeah, I wish you would because thinking has become. Uh, I'm a very good welder, and I'm not too sure about the thinking. But that's another point. God damn it. Look, I have heard 10 times today people talking about their lack of skills. Why, why do people boast of this? It's not that, I mean, it, I don't think it's, it's a virtue to be skilled, but on the other hand, I don't think it's a virtue to be unskilled. I mean, there are things that it might be convenient to learn. Certainly, if you do posit the notion of a collapsed society, you cannot safely posit it and think you have a place in it if you have no skills, if you cannot manipulate things in the material world. I mean, Gulch, Gulch was a bullshit place. It was full of bankers. <laughs> Who the hell needs bankers in a collapsed world? For Christ's sake. <laughs> what you need in a collapsed world are my neighbors. You need somebody who had the foresight to save some seed. You need, and you need Colonel Applegate, for God's sake, to keep the people off your back. Or it'd be better if you didn't need Colonel Applegate. The, the desirable situation, it seems to me, is where everybody is capable of doing all of these things. Now, people are capable of doing all of these things. There's no reason why you have to shut your life off from these things. Everybody must program now, it seems to me, to be adequately prepared for the collapse. You must be a marksman. You must have a healthy, supple body. You must be able to farm, to till, to build, to read, to write, philosophize. Subtract any of these from a person, what have you? Less than you had before. Why do you want to be less? Seems to me being more and more is the proposition. Thomas Wolfe, the older one, used to go into the library at the university he attended and weep because he knew he could never read all of those books, but he wanted to. I weep when I know that I'll never have my own particle accelerator, <laughs> but I want one. I'll try. I'll try anything. More, more. I mean, this thing is empty. It has nothing in it. You can fill it up with everything. This, it's nothing. It's always imperfect. It can be a thing of iron and steel and water and fire, but it rarely is. But you can try. Why say, oh, to hell with it? Why be a, a, a cog when you can be a machine or whatever? Why be an acorn when you can be a tree? Be a forest. Be the whole goddamn galaxy. So far as we know, that's all there is in it. Your mind. I'm a fiction. You're a fiction. This thing creates the universe. Now, why treat it so shabbily? Well, and kids. God, kids operate an underground railway. Get them out of that thing, that public school, school system, public or private if it's a system. Get them to places where they can be creative, where they can begin to educate themselves in the classical way. What the hell is science? Observation. All children observe. They must observe. They have eyes. Some of them, most of them. So do a favor to get the kids out. You can at least do that. If you produce the damn things, you ought to take care of them. <laughs> and taking care of them strongly suggest to me that you never let the state have them for a minute, not a second. Get them away from that. Withdraw. Retreating is not an ignoble activity. 
Retreating stupidly is a stupid activity. Kurt's absolutely correct about that. But to retreat is fine. Who wants to be out there with them? Workers of the world disperse. Galt was right about that. He just chose poor companions for the trip. Yeah. Um, you made a comment a little while ago about keeping the others off your back. Mm -hmm. um, now, the world that I see when I look out there is a world that has a lot of dumb people in it who mm -hmm. have a lot of weapons. And I will never be able to accumulate enough weapons to keep them off my back if they intend to come after me. True. Now, true. What I was going to bring up is your comment that there is no truth and there are no rights. Now, now that I understand what you're talking about, I agree with you. However, those are my defenses. Those are the things I use to keep the dumb people off my back. Fine. If I can convince them that there is truth and that there is rights, mm -hmm. these are these are propaganda. Mm -hmm. And propaganda is the way you keep the dumb people from attacking you. It may. It may be. If it works, fine. I think you should do it. It's the only thing that can work because we can't. Oh, yeah. But that would be like my saying that what I said is the only thing that can work. I think we'd both be yeah. suspicious of that. But, but whether it's the alternative is either you fight him or you convince him not to fight you. Well, not necessarily. You can also be someplace else. You can turn aside. I mean, it's just another possibility. You figure out your own way. That's right. But I think that, you see, I just would, would explain to you why I wouldn't depend on your way. But that's, that's trivial. Who cares? Certainly you don't care, and I don't care. If your way works, I'll be the first to be scurrying around to, uh, uh, to do it. I've had some experience with your way. Well, I wouldn't trust it across the street anymore. That way does not work now because the propaganda has started to deteriorate. Mm -hmm. But um, this country started 200 years ago with a uh, something of a success of that propaganda. Mm -hmm. So the tax collectors did generally leave people alone. And it was successful, and so you did not need to have a gun and shoot it out with a tax collector. That country does not exist. Right, it's gone now. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but I, I don't want to live in a world where I'm constantly have to look over my shoulder. But you do. So the question is, when you look over your shoulder, what do you do with the information you received? I mean, that's, that's, that's crucial. Now you've looked over your shoulder, you see that it is dominated by, by very vicious people of, of a, of, who do not think much, who, who act like the great slug or, or some sort of a creature in a slime mold. Uh, they ooze around, uh, just <laughs> covering up things. And now you know that. Uh, do you still want to talk to them about your rights? I, if you can do it, I think that's fine. Uh, there are some bizarre variations of that. There's that wonderful attorney in Alaska, John Matonis, who has offered to defend free of charge anyone accused of slaughtering an IRS agent. And that's, an, that's a creative use of the court system, but it's, it's neither an activity I would uh, uh, recommend to people nor a defense that I'd recommend to them. I don't think you should kill IRS agents uh, because they're not worth the powder. And I don't think you should go to court to defend yourself against them. But that's just what I think. I live in a place where it works. You live in a place where you must do something else. As somebody once said, let a thousand flowers bloom. <laughs> yes. individual mind and the individual body and I'd like to know how you deal with what seems to me a trend in the world towards a time when we aren't going to have individual minds and individual bodies. Uh, we started with blood transfusions, we're up to organ transplants. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem long before we really will become interchangeable as far as bodies go. Uh, there are all kinds of ways already of manipulating our minds. It seems to me we're only at the beginning of that, and very soon uh, we won't have much autonomy over our minds anymore. It's a problem we must face, that's all. It's just another one of those pesky things that comes along. And I think one of the things, again, resort first to the understanding that the brightest and most creative people are not doing that for that purpose, that they may, may be you. 
And so that if you're terribly worried, I take it genetic engineering may disturb you. I think it's wonderful myself, but that's, that shows that there, there's, we can now look at it from several different ways. If you're terribly worried about it, I suggest you immediately embark on an, an intensive study of it and become a genetic engineer. Uh, for several reasons, defensive reasons, subverting the system if you find it to be pernicious, uh, or comforting yourself uh, if, if you find that it isn't. But it occurs to me that these are the, the activities that sensibly suggest themselves. It is not, I believe, sensible to take the view that the federal government should pass a law against research. I mean, that salvation that occurs to me is not uh, useful. So you must do something yourself. So long as there is one individual left, untainted by the fears that, that you suggest, that individual can, if the person chooses, fight. And that's the way it is. I, I would choose to, I think, today, tomorrow, I may choose to surrender. You see, because tomorrow is, uh, the cells are different, everything's changed. You've got to leave some room open for maneuvering here. Yes? Uh, I have a slight problem with the uh, feeling to take comfort from the fact that the world's full of dummies, although I agree with you. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me that there are enough smart people that are willing to sell anything to the dummies to make this up. Mm -hmm. A good case in point is a few years ago, a Russian pilot pulled a big image band, the CIA paid a million dollars. He took the missiles apart and they were full of RCA chips. I have no RCA stock, but I would have skipped a dividend. You know, I mean, we didn't have to sell them those chips just to. It's hard to take comfort in the fact that dumb people may be running things because there's always enough people that are smart that are willing to make a profit. They don't whatever the ideology is. Yeah. yeah, but you see, know? I think the thing is those chips were obsolete by the time they were sold. And, the th and they it's. Still work. Yeah, they still work, but there'll be something better that you can do and that somebody else can do. And so I think that the, the clever people are always a step or two ahead. I agree with you that. The, the, the selling of these things, or the selling out of these things, it occurs to me, is always a step back. It's always, uh, it's always yesterday, as, as, uh, as I said this morning. Those were the good old days. The thing to do is, when you're worried terribly about that, is just to go do something better. I just think that's the, now's the time. There's really no excuse for not, uh, well, I have a favorite scenario there. I just trust that some molecular biologist friend of mine, I've, I've tried to make friends in, in certain crucial areas, uh, will uh, cure, supposedly cure cancer, and will then take the view that the only people who can be cured of cancer are those people uh, with whom they spend an evening uh, carousing, and so that you can check out their personality, because it wouldn't be much sense in curing everybody of cancer if they had terrible personalities. Um, <laughs> and that, you see, that's not terribly far-fetched because somebody in this room, I'm sure, is capable of doing something so impressive that if they did it and then said, I will deploy it only to certain people, that it would make quite an impact. Well, they wouldn't even have to say it. They might just have to do it. And that would give us, again, another edge. I think, see, everything that, my feeling is that everything... I can think of is simply an extension of the presentation this morning, Dunnigan's pre presentation, and it was brilliant and accurate, that now we are armed, and I don't think it has happened before. We really have better equipment. We have the smarter people, we have the more energetic people, the fitter people. All of these things now are what we refer to as our friends. Our friends are now smarter than our enemies. And I think we can take advantage of this. I don't know how. And if I did know how and you listened to me, you'd be the great and, of course, horse's ass. Because the thing is, we now are all armed to be able to do it ourselves in many different ways. Yes, sir. Carl, you pointed out, and let me add to it, we also have always been armed with brains that oh. we could use. Yes, true. And we have neglected that. But I think he made a powerful point. The state has been able to buy its way uh, into these things in the past always. Uh, they could, uh, in, in many different ways, I don't think that's possible anymore, although I would be willing to predict 
there will be an attempt to pass federal statutes limiting the amount of storage uh, for home machines within the decade. But I can also predict that, of course, it won't work. It never will work. The, the happy, it, I, don't, I, try, I sometimes try to place revolutionary moments, not that I believe there are any, but there are some that you, you have conceits about. It occurs to me that the CB radio uh, might have been that moment that the state passed in to a secondary position. The CB radio was the first time I can think of, including prohibition, when the state was absolutely unable to control the technology and gave up. With prohibition, they were unable to control it, but they didn't give up for a while. This time, they surrendered. Imagine. Liberty won while we were just sitting around theorizing about it. Liberty won a great, and it was the Battle of Hastings has happened. And now we just have to proceed on to another, a few skirmishes here and there. And we're bound to win or, or die happy, which was a form of victory because they would dislike that most of all. I mean, if you went smiling, I think they would really, they'd curdle inside. Because they, they are such small, warped, mean, petty little beasts. I don't know what their species is. Is it like, what did, was it Pitt said about bear baiting? That the Puritans didn't mind the discomfort of the bear, but only the pleasure of the onlookers? And that's part, that's part of this, this thing. But anyway, take heart. I mean, the collapse isn't a, I, it may collapse in Kurt's terms, but that's not a collapse. That is simply a demolition of an old termite-ridden structure. We don't need it. Doesn't do anything for anybody in particular. Yes, a lot of people will be hurt, but what the hell. Uh, it's a glorious beginning. It's the happiest thing that can happen. It will happen in one way or the other, either tumultuously in Kurt's view or in sort of a dull way in my view. We'll just wake up one morning and there'll, uh, Richard Nixon will be trying to get a job as a soda jerk. <laughs> and and uh, Ronald Reagan will be trying to get back into the movies. And creative people will be everywhere being creative. And these uncreative people, I don't know what to do with them. I guess keep them for pets. <laughs> <laughs> or what? <laughs> Yeah, I'll just leave them alone. I'd love to see a bunch of, I'd love to see a group of managers left alone somewhere. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Be cruel, but then I don't mind that. God, let the punishment fit the crime. Excellent idea. But at any rate, that's the final thing. We have won. We are winning. We will win. Even if they, we don't, it was worth trying. You wouldn't want to live any other way, for God's sake. You can be free. You can be free today, not tomorrow. And a diller, a dollar, a 10 o'clock scholar, and six or seven other things. And thank you for inviting me. <laughs>